Welcome back to Sledgehammer Horror, guys. I am Ken Sledge, and let's talk horror. Now, today I'm joined by the amazing Frank Dietz. Frank, how are you doing today, man? I'm good. I'm very good. Thanks for having I, me on. <laughs> I am so stoked to have you here. Um, but before we talk about why you're here, Frank, I would like for the people that may not know you to get to know you a little bit. Um, okay. Frank has found success in the film industry as a writer, producer, director, actor, and animator. Um, he grew up in Long Island, New York, and attended the State University of Oswego. Uh, he also majored in theater and art. So, you know, growing up oh, out there, New York, Long Island boy, going in there for theater and art, what gave you the push in the direction to go, you know what, this is what I want to do with my life? <laughs> well, uh, oddly enough, um, the, the reason I'm on the show today is, is what pushed me. Um, it, it was seeing a movie. It, I saw a movie when I was six. And that movie, uh, like, has has basically sent me on the path of this crazy career. Um, I, I mean, I I attended um, Oswego just because um, I, I I wasn't good at anything other than you know acting and art, so it seemed like the only the, the wisest choice to you know to uh, pursue the perfect fit. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Well, I mean, and, you know, you've been in such films as Zombie Nightmare, Rock and Roll Nightmare, and the criminally underrated Black Roses, um, yeah. so, and, and many, many more on top of that. So you're almost like a cult staple at this point. So um, looking back and reflecting on these movies that, you know, you've been a part of that have had such a huge cult success, how does that feel for you? Oh, my gosh. It's 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 sometimes it's it's it, I, it kind of blows my mind, honestly. I mean. You know, we made these movies in the late 80s, um, which was the perfect time to make movies like this because we were all still doing practical effects. And, and, uh, and it, you know, you, you, were, you were living by uh, if Joe Bob Briggs would, you know, give you, you know, points for boobs and blood and beasts and whatever, you know. And so we had to make sure it was all, it was all loaded up as much as possible for, you know, all the, all the, the four movies that I did. Uh, with with John Fasano back then, um, mm -hmm. Black Roses being sort of the, I think the favorite. Um, it seems to me from the fans, um, I think it's my favorite too. But um, it was it was a wonderful time. It was you know we're not working for a studio or anything like that. We're these are independent pictures, and we were everybody was wearing all kinds of different hats to you know depending on what was needed. Absolutely. And, uh, uh, yeah, yeah, it's good times. <laughs> come on as an actor and then you leave knowing how to be a key grip yeah exactly yeah <laughs> yep but, and I mean, craft service like, and you name it <laughs> right but <laughs> you, even yourself personally more feathers in the cap because you've been a screenwriter for the another criminally underrated the creep show tv show um mm -hmm. which is absolutely fantastic i hate kids uh, agreed and so much more <laughs> so um, what's it like for you differentiating between being an actor or a writer or a producer? How do you get in the groove of knowing which one you want to do for which project? I think the, it, it almost happens organically. Honestly, it's like it always seemed it always seemed that when one thing wasn't necessarily working out, one of the other things was. And sure. I was um, I don't know if I'm smart or lucky or whatever it was to be diversified enough that. I could I, so, for example, when when I, I you know I was a Disney uh, Disney animation artist for many years, and that was that was a great gig until it ended. At which point, at least I had other areas to go back to. I was working as a screenwriter before I went to Disney. So after those eight eight years, uh, when that when that came to an abrupt end, I just went right back to doing screenwriting again. Um, sure. And some of you know some of my fellow artists um, didn't have any other skills than just doing what they've been doing their whole lives. So um, I, I always I always tell people when I do you know talks and whatever you know talk to to students you know um, pursue your your bliss uh, at, without a doubt, but it's always good to have a backup too. <laughs> sure. Well, like you said, you can instead of perfecting one thing, be great at a lot of things. You know, like that's, that's the motto I teach my kids, you know, you, mm -hmm. instead of perfecting one thing, be as amazing as you can in many different things. Cause like you said, yeah. that one bliss that you're looking for, that one big dream, if that doesn't happen, you can still have other dreams that can lead you back to where you want to be in the end. And, yeah. you know, we, we, we talk about you, you know, as a producer, director, actor, animator, 
also about to be a published author. Your book is coming out. Uh, we don't yeah. have a specific release date as of filming, but right. can you tell us a little bit about the book before um, we actually talk about why you're here? Yeah, sure. Um, well, basically for the last few years in, in particular, it's the last you know five, six, seven years, I've been doing a lot of um, uh, commentary, live commentaries at, uh, for screenings of Zombie Nightmare, Black Roses, Rock and Roll Nightmare. And uh, and they're so much fun, and I love to do it because I get to tell the stories as the movie is un unfolding. Um, and I thought, you know, I, I have so much fun doing this. Maybe it's a good idea for me to put this down on paper um, and uh, so that other people who don't maybe can't go to these screenings at least can read the stories of what an insane time it was to make those films. Um, and so it started like that. I was just going to, it's a memoir, um, uh, you know, it meant it was originally meant to just be about the the horror movies and from the eighties, but then I thought, you know, well, how did how did I get to there, you know? Um, and so I just started to talk about growing up as what we now call a monster kid, um, and then and then and then like how what did that lead to afterwards? Sure. And I felt like those were all so really important things, and there's still and a lot more fun stories to throw in there. Um, so it's an, it, it's called uh, Monsters, Movies, and Me, and um, like I said, uh, it'll it'll be out in the next couple of months for sure. Um, I don't, as soon as I get a release date, it'll be up on my all my social media. It'll be on my front lawn, wherever you got in the back of my car. You name it, I'm <laughs> I'll be I'll be posting about it quite often. <laughs> well, I'm not going to give you his license plate number, and I'm not going to give you his home address, <laughs> but what I will give you is all the social media links, and those are right down in right. the description, guys. So make sure, like he said, the best way to stay up to date, not only on the book, but on the other things he's going to be working on in the future, mm -hmm. is by following him on social media and becoming a part of his social media family. Those links are all down in the description. So please take a second, go follow him on social media, come on back, because now we're going to get to the meat of the sandwich, you guys. Um, in order for you to be a Ooh. part of these movies that influenced us, like... Black Roses, Rock and Roll Nightmare, Zombie Nightmare. Horror had to start for you somewhere, Frank. So now mm -hmm. I would like to go back to the past and talk about what it was that got you started in the horror genre, your first horror movie. And mm -hmm. Frank, the first horror movie you watched was? Six years old, little black and white, a, a huge 12-inch screen. <laughs> uh, I My parents were, were and their friends were like playing cards in the other room. Uh, and I was alone. My little brother was three years younger than me. And at that time, he was only three and not the greatest playmate. So they would just sit me down in front of the television. Mm -hmm. And this movie comes on. And it's called, I didn't know the title of it when I was watching it that first time. But the movie is Abbott and Costello Meet Frankenstein. Now, you have to understand that at six years old, I had never, I didn't know what Frankenstein was. I didn't know who Dracula was. I'd never heard of the Wolfman. And mm -hmm. I'm sitting there and this movie is unfolding before me. And I, I was enthralled. I couldn't believe what I was watching. It was magical to me. Um, and, and I, I didn't want it to end <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> more and more and more. And the thing is, is that you got to realize is that back then, this is before the age of instant gratification. So sure. I didn't see that movie again for years because, you know, it was the only way to see it was on television or if you had a lucky enough to have an art house, you know, cinema somewhere that might show it. But other than that, TV was your only way. You know, mm -hmm. so that, that would be like, a, you know, running down to the uh, to the uh, corner store every Monday or whatever to get the TV guide and just TV go guide, through it and baby. try looking for the movie, you know, right? And you always look for, well, with Abbott and Custom Frankenstein, it would be listed as a comedy, but all the other like universal monsters back then in yeah. TV guide, they were called, it was called melodrama. So melodrama equals monsters, right? So that's, sure. you know, you, that's how you'd know, right? Um, and, um, so you'd have to wait. I, had to, I waited the longest time before I saw that movie again, but it was, it was in oh. my brain. And I remember drawing pictures from it. Um, uh, I would sit in the, uh, in front of the bathroom mirror and change into the Wolfman, you know, yeah. 
even humming like the music in my because it was it was so ingrained in, into my psyche at that point. Um, and what I what was so funny about it is that um, I, I I didn't even realize the importance of the film back then. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, to me, it was just the greatest thing I'd ever seen. Um, still is, by the way, my favorite movie of all time. That has never yeah. changed since I was six. Um, and, you know, but even though it's a comedy, uh, it's the monsters are played straight, you know, oh, yeah. almost almost entirely. There's one there's a one moment where uh, and it's an and it's an, actually a very important moment. Um, it's uh, it's early on in the film is uh, Dracula has put Wilbur. Lou Costello into a trance in this wax museum while he and then Dracula wakens the Frankenstein monster. Dracula is leading him past Lou Costello and Glenn Strange playing playing the monster looks at looks at Costello and, to, and goes oh like he's afraid of him right and it's a it's a great moment for this 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 kind of a movie because it basically what it's doing is saying to the kids that are watching this movie you know what? It's all going to be okay. Yeah. You know, yes, these are scary, but look, look at, he just got scared of, of Lou, Lou Costello. So <laughs> it's, um, and David Scow actually, I think was, uh, uh, David J. Scow, the author, and um, screenwriter, uh, was the one who, who actually pointed that out to me first. And, and I was like, wow, that is so right on. That is so mm -hmm. right on. Well, um, and like you said, this is the perfect mix of horror and comedy because the monsters are playing it straight. But Abbott and Costello are still being Abbott and Costello. Like you have the scene where they're pushing the bed up against the door and trying to block the door, and then Frankenstein, it's a pull door. Like he just yeah, opens right. the door and they're like, oh, you know, yeah. like they're still being silly, but it's still like that perfect blend of horror and comedy that still a lot of movies today completely miss on. They try to yeah. go over on one side or the other. And this movie really did nail that perfect mix of this, horror yeah. and comedy. Without a doubt, it's it it, it really set the bar um for for uh, the, I've always said that when it comes to horror comedies and people, you know, people like Tom Holland know this and, you know, then some other, um, uh, you know, terrific directors who were still with us and, and still making films. And it is a, for a horror comedy to work, you have, there's two things that are important. The, the, the threat has to be real. Yeah. So the monsters have to be, the creatures, whatever it is, have to be played straight. And the comedy needs to be character driven as mm -hmm. opposed to, as opposed, Opposed to you know slip on a banana peel kind of stuff, and right. most of what happens in Abbott and Costello with Frankenstein is exactly that. Bud and Lou, uh, the, the the well, the screenwriters very wisely decided to sidestep any of the sort of who's on first routines that they sure. were famous for, and they're just sticking to the characters that they're playing. I mean, they might break the fourth wall every once in a while, but I kind sure. of love that myself. But um, and you know, you've got the monsters played by the actual actors who played the monsters in the earlier mm -hmm. films. You know, Lon Chaney Jr. is is the is Lawrence Talbot, the Wolfman. Bela Lugosi playing Dracula for the first time in 17 years. It was only the second time that he ever played Count Dracula, and yet he's the most famous actor Absolutely. associated with that role, right? Which says so much, right? Um, and then Glenn Strange, who played the Frankenstein monster in House of Frankenstein and House of Dracula, the two earlier films, and actually gets m 10 times more screen time in this movie than he got in both of those earlier movies put together. Absolutely. Um, and uh, and uh, there's, oh my God, there's so much about this film that when, you know, as I got older and, you know, had more access to it, things occurred to me about it that I, I you know obviously just wouldn't couldn't possibly have known back then but mm -hmm. there's so many elements of that movie that imp ended up impacting my career um for uh, a, a couple of examples are um I mostly as a screenwriter write either I get hired to write either comedies or horror <laughs> So um, that's, you know, that's where that that well comes from. Um, and also what I didn't see the very first time I saw the movie, because when I turned, well, I guess when I turned it on, the, the opening titles had already happened. Yeah. Which is why I didn't know what the name of the movie was even at the time. Um, but the opening of the film is animated. 
And it's this little animation sequence with Frankenstein comes in and he knocks on, on these coffins. These little skeletons come out that look like Bud and Lou and they scream and run away. And then they then they have a little cast list with the Wolfman, Dracula and the monster all coming over this hill. Mm -hmm. And of course, you know, I ended up <laughs> working for Walt Disney Feature Animation for eight years. So, uh, you know, there's all these little pieces of this film that I think just sort of like, like, I don't know, like shrapnel just stuck in me, you know, and then came out later on, you know, a great, great shrapnel, but, uh, right. And, uh, and it's, it's, it, here's the, here's the reason that I feel like this movie is so very important. Um, it, very ironically, the, the universe, the, the executive Universal Studios decided that, well, the monsters have had their run. You know, um, and Abbott and Costello movies were not doing well at the box office either. The decision to put them together was the idea of just like this is this will be the death knoll for both for both of them, and we'll be yeah. done with them, right? I'm not realizing, of course, they're actually making the the very best Abbott and Costello movie that's ever been made, yeah. and that the audience would respond so well to it. And why that's so great is that. For years after, I mean, to this day, Abbott and Costello meet Frankenstein is like a portal by which young people can experience these these classic characters for the first time in a very gentle, a much more gentle way. Oh yeah. Um, and then as they get older, if they you know if they stay interested, then they'd be like, well, then they can watch frankenstein and dracula and the wolfman and the you know yeah. the films that that it all came from um but but the irony of course is, is that the movie that was supposed to be the death of of these monsters is in fact the thing that's keeping the monsters alive and that, that was the fantastic. that was the the metal pipe that the lightning hit to bring those monsters back to life yeah you know, and that's yeah. brilliant and, one thing that was also very cool, you know, when I was growing up and I and I couldn't really always see the movie, a lot there was a lot of merchandise out there. There were I had a I had a a binder, a school binder, right, the the three ring binder that yeah. had uh, had the Frankenstein monster on it because they just called him Frankenstein, right? Sure. Um, and the image it was a painting, but it, the image was Glenn Strange from that movie. In fact, almost all the merchandise utilized the images of Lugosi from that movie as opposed to the original 1931 film. And, you know, and the Wolfman, um, I'm, I'm, I'm such a, I'm, well, I'm an artist, but I'm also a big monster nerd. So mm -hmm. I can look at a, I can look at a photo of, of Lon Chaney Jr. in that makeup and I'll know exactly which of the five movies it's from. That's, <laughs> that's amazing. Well, it's, it's partly because you had realized that I've also drawn them many 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 times okay yeah <laughs> so you do you do kind of get used to like the the the, spe the specifics you know and and the makeup for that film was um not jack pierce who had done the, all the previous films kind of almost solo practically um but it was the westmores um and their team that had like recreated jack pierce's creatures okay. but but did them they made them easier to apply because Jack Pierce's stuff was all build up like you know took a really really long time and well, the Westmore team was able to uh, Jack Keevan and these guys they they were able to, to to utilize you know rubber appliances that were uh, much faster to apply and and um and make made it easier on the actors uh easier on the budget and the uh obviously the time that it takes yeah you know, so, um and and I there's something about the look of Glenn Strange's monster in that film that I just love it. I have I have I've done oil paintings of him. I've done, I've done probably a hundred different drawings of him. Um, it, it's just it's so it's, it's so it's so beautifully angular and and um, and and just the fact that we're we're actually getting to see Glenn Strange utilize. His his monster chops, if you will, you know, right. where you know in the previous films you basically lay on a slab for most of the movie, and in the last <laughs> in the last five minutes, you know, he'd break loose and you know, uh, yeah, right, <laughs> exactly, <laughs> throw somebody out a window, you know, whatever, right, yeah, uh, throw a little girl <laughs> in the water, whatever, yeah, yeah um, right.
<laughs> so, you know, we've, we've talked, this movie obviously has had a huge impact on you and your life. Um, yeah, and one question I always ask is what was the scene that affected you the most from Abbott and Costello meets Frankenstein? You know, it, that I, I <laughs> you told me that you were going to ask this question and I had to think about it because there, there are so many, but I think that probably the one that, that hit me the hardest when I was watching it that very first time was the scene where uh, Lawrence Lawrence Talbot uh, is in the woods and they're looking for for the character Joan. They can't find her, and he's he's forgotten. He's he's forgotten that the the moon is full, and he falls down, and he changes into the Wolf Man right before our very eyes through the most stunning time lapse photography. Um, I know that uh, I'm, I'm not sure if it was John Fulton or not that that uh, that did it at that time, but. It's it's one of the it's actually one of the best trans you know full on transformations in the entire run of the five Wolfman movies. Oh, one of easily. the very best, and it, it's so smooth. And then him you know him getting up and being in full full werewolf mode and uh, chasing him, trying to trying to kill Lou Costello basically. I I I was like that was the character that just appealed to me, and I think also the fact that that Lawrence Talbot, and this is something I still love about this movie so much, the character of Lawrence Talbot in this film, played by Lon Chaney Jr., is, uh, is like a hero. Yeah. In the, pre in the previous film, he's always like, he just wants to die. He doesn't, you know, he's, he's miserable. He, he's looking for a cure or just to, just to finally be at peace and whatever. And he's kind of, you know, it's kind of annoying <laughs> sometimes, you know. Uh, and in this film, I love that the, the Wolfman is on a mission to stop Count Dracula from reviving the Frankenstein monster. And so, so it was really cool because he's a, he's a monster, but at the same time, he's also a hero. Right. And, and that just really appealed to me. But that scene in the woods when, when he's, he's on full Wolfman uh, mode, I, I, that's what I was like, just talked about, you know, looking in the bathroom mirror and, and, you know, trying to, trying to change, you know, <laughs> right? you know? Yes. um, my, my God, I can't even, I don't even know how many boxes of Crayola crayons I went through drawing him over and over and over and over again. You know? <laughs> but it's awesome. Like that really started to inspire you to become who you are today. Like, I think that's why horror movies to me are so important. Like they really, when they stick with you, they really, really stick with you. And, yeah. you know, to hear how much you talk and how highly you talk in these movies, it's so inspiring. You know, you know the Wolfman from each movie, you know, and all these different things that you know. Like, it's really inspiring to see your passion for these movies. And this is a movie that I have talked about before, and I think it's a fantastic movie. I think it's funny. I think it's scary. I think the practical effects in it, are they are still very well done. But what would you say your favorite scene? We know which scene affected you the most. But what would you say your favorite scene from the film is? Uh, it's it, it's it's very very short. It's 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 basically all in one shot, and it's at the very end of the film, uh, during when all the chaos is going on. The Frankenstein monster is loose. He's chasing Bud and Lou. Drac Count Dracula and the Wolfman are fighting each other, and the and there's uh, there's a moment where this is kind of a spoiler, folks, but Count Dracula. Uh, is gonna going to escape. He walks out onto this balcony, and and he starts to turn into a bat. And they got this beautiful animation uh, that was not done by Walter Lance, by the way. I'll mention that in a second. Anyway, Dracula starts to turn into a bat, and he's got, about to fly. He turns into a bat. He's about to fly away, and the Wolfman comes running up, grabs him, and they dive over that balcony, and they go crashing into the into the sea and the rocks below, and. There was, I just, I couldn't wait for that shot. I mean, every time I watch, I still do. I still, every time I watch it, I was just like, I can't wait for this shot because it's so cool. And yeah. it's, you know, it's, it's too bad that the wolf man had to die, but if, but he's, he's the wolf man, you know. But another, another thing to point out, by the way, uh, another reason that the movie works for kids is that no, none of the, no, there's no, nobody dies. No, no good people die in the right. movie. Only the bad guys die. Um, and, uh, and even, even when they die, it's kind of, Pain. it's, it's not, yeah. I mean, the, the Frankenstein monster is, you know, is, as he always is, is in fire and he just, you know, crashes through the dock at the end and, 
the the bad the bad um, femme fatale gets you know gets thrown out the window because you know Frankenstein monster is always throwing people out the window this way that way you know yeah of course <laughs> um so and like you said I, that was, usually I ask what death is your you know most impactful but with this movie like you said there really isn't much death in this movie so um right one question I ask which I think would be in my opinion impossible today. But I got to stick to the script, man, Frank. So I got to mm-hmm. ask. Yeah. Uh, remakes, requels, sequels, all the rage in Hollywood. People love to do it. They like to take these ideas and recreate them now. Um, would you like to see Abbott and Costello meets Frankenstein redone today? I don't think it's. I don't think it's really possible. Um, I, you know, I'm yeah, sure. you can make a you can make a a a horror comedy that is maybe similar to it, but. Um, I, I don't think today's audiences would would um, I, I look I've seen I've seen modern horror comedies that had monsters in them and and a lot of them pardon my French suck mm-hmm. because they're not following the the rules that we talked about earlier right the monster's a goofball yeah yeah the monster's goofy um, and 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 you know or the or the characters are all you know, you know, slipping on banana peels and stuff, you know, and, and over and overreacting about things. I mean, Lou Costello, you know, back then had, was the greatest at, at funny fear. Mm-hmm. You know, he was, he was really, you could tell he's really terrified, but that he was such an incredible comedian that he knew, he knew how to sell it um, with, you know, by and make it funny and still, and you still believe that he is, he's absolutely terrified. It's um, right. it's really he was a he was a brilliant a brilliant comedian without a doubt. And um, again, I that's why so. I think that something like that would not work today. I think this is a movie yeah. that it's a perfect time capsule for what it was, and this is something mm-hmm. you just wouldn't be able to successfully redo today. Well, you couldn't um, really uh, you couldn't really update it uh, no. either. You know what I mean? It's like you could you can remake you can update the Blob. Um, you know, which which Chuck Russell did brilliantly, I think, mm-hmm. um, and or the fly and, you know, Cronenberg kind of reinvents it. But, you know, it's still essentially based on the same story. Um, th- I don't this is not one that I think that would 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 adapt um, to modern no. times very well. No. So we know how horror started for you, Frank, with Abbott and Costello meet Frankenstein. <laughs> but here for a second, I do want to throw a little bit of a curveball at you. My little okay. buddy Ghostface is here. And he has a question for you. All What's right. your favorite scary movie, Frank? What is your favorite horror movie of all time? Okay. My favorite, I mean, aside, putting aside, aside this from, film that yeah. we're talking about. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, have a, I have a very, very unique one that you probably don't hear much about. Um, so you're going to love this. <laughs> I saw, uh, another film that I saw when I, was, when I was young, I saw it in a movie theater. And not knowing what I was getting into because I spent the next month terrified to go to sleep. And the movie um, is called Island of Terror. And it's from 19, I think it was released in the U.S. in 1967. It's a British film. Um, It stars Peter Cushing and um, Edward Judd. And it is, it's not as well known as like the, the Hammer movies, you know, the Christopher Lee films, but Peter sure. Cushing is in it and he's wonderful in it. But it's it's basically about, uh, there's a bunch of scientists on this little Scottish island and they're they're trying to find a cure for cancer. And of course, something goes terribly, terribly wrong. And what are released are these creatures that look almost like these uh, bumpy turtle shells and they have a tentacle that comes out. And if they grab you they latch onto you they they basically they liquefy your all the bones in your body all the calcium in your body and you just turn into a pile of mush Ooh. and it was di- it was directed by terence fisher who was one of the great probably the best hammer uh, horror director mm-hmm. um and it's a great script um and i I'm, I'm always trying to sell the movie because i can still watch it and still remember the fear of seeing it for the first time. So yeah. that's my that's my favorite. And if you get into more modern stuff, I'm a big fan of The Dead Zone, um, Cronenberg's The Dead Zone. I'm a huge fan mm-hmm. of that. Um, and uh, I love Tom Holland. Tom Holland's a dear friend of mine. And he's uh, and his Fright Night is, I think, is also a perfect example of play the monster straight, 
have have whatever comedy this that's in there be character driven. Yeah, you know, mm-hmm. he got it. He gets it. Yeah, and uh, Child's Play is my favorite horror franchise of all time. So obviously, without Tom Holland, that wouldn't happen. So yeah. and Friday Night, another movie, like you said, even like his references to um, Peter Vincent, you know, the vampire yes. killer, and like he's so he's so funny in the movie. Like when they're going yeah. out to the car. And um, Brewster's like, I thought you said you were going to help me. You weren't afraid. And he shuts the trunk and he's like, I lied. Like that <laughs> part to me, like it just never, ever gets old. Like it's played so well and it's oh. just, it's perfect. Like I, I, I do not love right Roddy McDowell, right? Roddy McDowell was just so <laughs> incredible. I got to, I met, oh, I actually met him once. He was very, very kind and very, uh, you know, gracious. Um, yeah. But, uh, but yeah, you know, I mean, there's still, there's a lot of movies and, you know, there, there are recent movies that I've liked a lot too. I, I loved Barbarian. I thought that was terrific. So um, good. I wanted to see more movies like that, you know, that, that are not, you know, the cookie cutter, Friday the 13th slasher movies and you know and so forth not that there's anything wrong with those movies at all I think they're 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 safe scares and they're they're great they're great date movies for for horror fans right um but you know then something like Barbarian comes along and it it catches me off guard and I'm like okay (laughs) wow yeah that's that's great yeah that was definitely and, you know, one of those movies that had the perfect marketing too like you had no idea what you were getting into I just thought of the other, other one of my biggest and probably in my top five is is the original Dawn of the Dead, yeah. um, which, you know, I was I think I was 19, uh, you know, when that movie came out. And oh, my God, I, I, I went back and watched it I did probably four times in the theater, you know, before it was gone. Um, and uh, I it's I just every time I watch it, I just I just marvel at what Romero pulled off with that uh-huh. film. Yeah. Then you got Savini with those effects, like, mm-hmm. and obviously Savini with his cameo with the biker gang, like, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I'm I'm a huge huge fan of everything Mr. Romero did. I think is pretty well done. And, well, that's um, why it was so fun to to work on Creep Show, um, on the I, TV series, you know, because what we really wanted to do was capture the spirit of the movie Creep Show, but whenever possible, um, I I know I did this with my with my episode Pesticide. Um, try to try to inject some of that George Romero sort of social commentary. Yes, you know what I mean? which you know, of course, Dawn of the Dead is loaded with, and a lot of his other films are as well. Um, but that was that was important to Greg Nicotero, also, um, who uh, uh, is uh, my brother. I love him to death, um, and uh, and we had a lot of fun <laughs> doing that episode and coming up with new ideas and, and so yeah. forth. I, there's something really quick that's so funny. When I, uh, we were going through the script and, and all of a sudden he was like, he was like, hey, he was like, because I had in the script, I'd already put it, there was a giant spider and there was a giant yeah. mosquito and so forth. And he was like, remember, remember the movie, The Food of the Gods? Right, that that movie from the seventies. Like, remember they had these giant rat heads, these big puppet rat heads. He goes like, "I want to make, I want to make those. Let's put a let's put a giant rat in the script." <laughs> I, was yes. like, I was like, "You got it, dude." <laughs> you know? Yeah, popped it in there, and and uh, I the only thing I insisted was I said, "You can't just you can't just have the head. Yeah, there has to be a tail. There has to be like an icky." like pink Whoa. hairy hairy yeah. tail that like slides over the bed that because that's more creepy to me than the, even the head is so absolutely um, well but, and uh, you know like you said <laughs> like with the social commentary in horror i think social commentary has been a part of horror for a long time and as long as it's done right where your social commentary is the not the forefront it's kind of the background the scares are your front yeah. and the social commentary is something that you can pick up on along the way I feel yeah. like that's something horror's always done. That's what horror is. It's a, it's scaring you by what's happening to in the world right now. Well, it should be a mirror, um, you know, to, to you know to be looking at ourselves. And look, and mm-hmm. when you're in a horror movie, certainly you put yourself and you you find a character that you're going to put yourself in the, in those shoes, and that you know then you get really pissed off when they make stupid decisions. You know? <laughs> but, um, um, uh, but yeah, it should always be a, a reflection of of society in in some manner. Yeah. You know, completely agree. Um, so, Frank, I've had an amazing time talking about your first horror movie, some of your favorite horror movies as well, and who you are as a person. But before I let you go, we always bounce back to the same question. And I've never been more sure of the answer of this question than I am right now. 
Well, like I said, according to my script, I have to ask. So of course. we're going to go back to Abbott and Costello meets Frankenstein. And what we're going to do is rank this movie on a skull count. Now, Frank, we're not ranking it on acting, production, score, direction. We're not being critics. Right. All we're doing is ranking this movie on how much it affected you on your first viewing. So zero skulls being not effective, five being extremely effective. You can use half and quarter skulls anywhere in the middle. Uh, Frank, what would your ranking of Abbott and Costello meet Frankenstein be? Easiest question in the world. <laughs> Big five, baby. Big five. I mean, obviously, obviously, it, it, it is a movie that literally affected my life and my career path. And mm -hmm. so, obviously, yeah, I can't I can't uh, I can't give it anything less than five. See, and I knew, like I said, I've never been more sure in my life of what the answer to that question was going to be. So um, yeah. I, I it, was, I it was a pretty easy bet though. Don't you think? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that was kind of an underhand softball one right there. Yeah, um, exactly. <laughs> so again, guys, I know I said it at the beginning, but we're at the end of the third act. Now the credits are about to roll and the curtain's about to drop. But before that happens, I do want to remind you that we have all of Frank's social media links down in the description. So please make sure you're giving him a follow on social media to stay up to date on not only when the book is coming out, but how you can become parts of what the things he's working on in the future, how you can check out some of his newer movies, some of the things he's writing, all that stuff. So make sure you're following him on social media. Uh, Frank, please don't go anywhere. I got a couple more questions for you. Um, okay. Everyone else, if you haven't already, please like and subscribe. It really does help to build the channel more than you know. And follow Sledgehammer Horror on social media. Our links are down in the description as well. But until next time, keep talking horror, stay what you are, and we'll see you guys soon.